Well hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Wildy Garden and in this video I'm going to be telling you guys the simplest way in which you can help wildlife in your own garden, doesn't matter where you are around the world, between spring and the autumn months and the best bit is it won't cost you a penny. So stick around and I'm going to explain exactly how you can help wildlife in your garden from spring right the way through to autumn. Now before we get started guys, I'd probably just say I have come to this site specifically near to where I live in Essex to bring you this video because this, believe it or not, in a few months time will be a magnificent wildflower meadow that has been in existence since the 1600s. So it's 400 plus years old and it is managed very, very sympathetically by the Essex Wildlife Trust and Essex County Council with these absolutely gorgeous red pole cows or red pole cattle and they are very sensitive with their management they are actually a hornless species and they're one of our true native species of cattle here in the UK and it's wonderful to see them grazing sensitively uh, it's just the best method in which you can use to manage a wildflower meadow sheep and cattle it's a very sensitive way no strimmers no big tractors no agricultural mach machinery so really brilliant but i've come to this site because as i say it's a 90 acre site that's managed by essex wildlife trust and I, this is the first time i've been here I, I can't wait to come back in the summer months and see how this place is looking but i thought it was very apt for today's video so without further ado let's have a look at why we are here today and exactly how you can help wildlife so today's message is very very simple guys but i want you to know exactly why I want to be shouting from the rooftops about this and I'm going to be all over social media over the coming weeks and have been in the run-up to this point in time because what I'd like to do is to get you guys and whoever you know, whoever has a garden, to adopt the concept of no mow summer. Now, there's many, many, many reasons we should be doing this in our own back gardens and I'm going to explain to you exactly some of them today. But one of them is the fact that we already have in England, we have, or in the UK, we have uh, a no mow May, which was introduced by Plant Life, which is a great initiative and it's been going for a few years now. And it's really, really good because in essence, they are encouraging people to not mow their green areas, not mow their grass, their lawns, whatever green space they have throughout the month of May, which is brilliant. And it's proved really, really effective. And I'm sure a lot of wildlife has benefited. However, I'd like to go a step further and I want to encourage you guys to adopt a no mow summer. And if you can't adopt a no mow summer, if you have to maintain the grass at a certain level because you've only got a small garden, you've got dogs, cats, kids, hey, <laughs> I've got all of the above by the cats, then there are ways in which you can do so. But I want to explain to you now some of the main reasons, if you like, why it is going to be so good and some of the wildlife that will definitely definitely benefit by you just putting your mower in the shed putting it away between the months of march through to september well as the cattle draw ever nearer <laughs> you can see this one just here absolutely not bothered by me they have a very nice temperament and that's why they are chosen to manage spaces like this uh, where there are public involved. You can see there's a public footpath running right the way through the middle here, and they're just not bothered. They're <laughs> quite happy to carry on munching away while I'm sat here jabbering on to you guys. I might be surrounded in a minute. <laughs> they really are beautiful animals. Anyway, so one of the first insects we ought to talk about that is going to benefit massively from simply not mowing your lawn. And by the way, I should say stick around because at the end of this video, I'm going to talk to you exactly about why you should be leaving it in terms of the height, what you can mow it to, and what you can probably expect to find in your meadow. But one of the first animals that will benefit most definitely will be your insects. So your pollinating insects. That's not one of them. <laughs> which will be your butterflies, your bees, your moths, flies, hoverflies, many, many insects that will be pollinating these wildflowers. And they'll be doing this from very early on in a lot of cases, in particular from, no, they're checking out my bag now, see if I've got any food for them. <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> um, so from very early on, 
there will be uh, insects, things like the early bumblebees here in the UK, hairy-footed flower bees, uh, bee flies, and these are all fantastic pollinating insects. And they will all be pollinating plants such as cuckoo flower, dandelion, lesser celandine, primrose, all species that you can look to plant in your existing lawn and do check that video out. I have done a video on how to make your own mini wildflower meadow in your own garden, which I'll put a link to at the end of this one. But the first category, as I say, are going to be the pollinating insects. So your butterflies, moths, um, hoverflies, bee flies, flies, bees, <laughs> all these insects, as well as beetles. Beetles are very good pollinators as well. So yes, the insects will certainly benefit from not you not mowing your lawn. So the second group of animals, while well, these two have a bit of a headbutting session, are going to be birds. Now, believe it or not, a lot of birds will be foraging through your meadow and your longer grass areas for a lot of the grubs of varying insects. So things such as starlings, they love a longer grassy area, although not too long, I must admit, because they like to probe into the grass for things such as um, the daddy long legs, the leather jacket grubs, um, the daddy long legs grubs, which are the uh, leather jackets, which will be in your lawn. They like to probe through for those. Also birds like the green woodpecker we get here in the UK, which have a, an, an enormously long tongue, uh, which is used for probing into ant hills, which the ants equally, I'm sure if you've ever not mown your lawn, will be encouraged to make ant hills in your lawn um, by simply not mowing your grass. So yes, woodpeckers and certainly the starlings, as well as house sparrows, they will eat things such as spiders and all the insects and beetles that'll be crawling through those longer grassy areas. So number two is all the birds. So point number three or group number three in terms of the animals that will benefit are going to be the grasshoppers. Now, <laughs> these cows are brilliant. The grasshoppers are absolutely fantastic and i'm sure it makes your heart back to when you were a child and hearing them in meadows or you know they're a very nostalgic sound i find and how many of you can honestly say you you've heard grasshoppers in your garden or in your neighbor's garden or your friend's garden in recent years i bet not many of you but grasshoppers can be easily attracted to your own garden by simply having some longer grassy areas even if it's just around the edges of the meadow or the nectar lawn um, and again we'll, we'll touch base a little bit on the maintenance towards the end of this video so stick around for that but grasshoppers are very very easy to attract to your garden if you've got just some longer areas even if you like i say don't mow it all and you just leave some patches around the edge they will definitely be attracted to your area and who wouldn't love the buzzing of grasshoppers grasshoppers <laughs> grasshoppers and crickets i was thinking of as well um, in your garden in the middle of summertime so the next group of animals I'd like to talk to you about that will definitely benefit from some longer grassy areas in your garden are going to be your amphibians. So ones that are more associated with the wildlife ponds that you've seen me create many of on this channel. So things such as your frogs, your toads, your newts, these are all going to be using longer grassy areas for hunting, especially in the winter months. So if you can leave some longer patches right the way through the year, so to create a mosaic of habitats, because these longer, what's known as tussock grasses, will be ideal for little froglets when it is warmer days, for example, in the winter time, to be able to hunt through those longer grassy areas in safety for very small invertebrates and insects that they're going to eat when they themselves are about this big in their first winter. So yes, frogs, toads, newts, they will all be lurking around in longer grassy areas in particular once they've finished the breeding season because they don't actually live their entire lives in a water body. Once they've actually finished breeding, a lot of them will migrate then off to log stacks, rock piles, your thick vegetation, your herbaceous borders, and that's why you'll no doubt find them under piles of bricks in the autumn and the end of summertime. Um, so yes, by having that longer grass and vegetation, it's a really good hunting ground for them and somewhere where they can stay nice and safe. Had to put my fleece on now, the sun's gone behind the clouds. It might be nearly the middle of April, but it's certainly still cool in the afternoons and evenings and in the mornings as well. However, the next group of animals we're going to be looking at are things like our reptiles and lizards. So things like in England, grass snakes, adders, smooth snakes, um, and obviously common lizards as well. They're all going to be really, really um, 
pleased, if you like, of finding some longer grassy areas in which they can hunt again for a lot of the above mentioned animals. So smaller insects, things like the common lizards, the slow worms, they'll be looking for smaller insects, um, worms as well that might be coming out of the grass in the evening time, especially through the night, uh, but also all the associated spiders, millipedes, wood lice, everything else, they're all going to be eating these kind of prey items. So yes, definitely, uh, and, and where you can get like a nice sunny, sh sunny patch in a garden, for example, you might be lucky enough if it faces east in the morning time when things like our grass snakes are warming up, then they will certainly curl up in a nice warm bed of grass um, where they can bask to absorb all the heat. Obviously they're cold blooded, so they need to warm up in the sun. So a nice sheltered sunny morning spot is absolutely brilliant for them. And if you want to attract them even more, you can add a bit of refugia or like I say, corrugated iron tin or a bit of roofing felt. They'll love to sit on or underneath this to bask to warm up. So uh, a, a, a nice bit of that sort of refugia, if you like, on the edge of some scrubby areas where they can retreat into if there's any risk of any predators coming. Um, alongside that longer grass is absolutely ideal habitat for them or even just in front of a log pile where they can scurry back into so yes common lizards um, smooth snakes not so much in the uk but certainly on the south coast potentially not so much in a garden but grass snakes certainly uh, common lizards and slow worms as well slow worms will really enjoy some longer grassy areas to hunt now you may not think about this next one, but actually all these longer grassy areas that are housing lots and lots of flying insects that are providing nectar and pollen sources through the summer months um, are going to be home to lots and lots of moths in the evening and at night time. It's easy to think that everything just shuts down when we go to bed, but obviously all your nighttime wildlife comes out, all your moths, and that therefore provides a fantastic supply of food for the next animal which is of course our bats so by having all these plants with all these pollinating insects the bats are going to have a field day so especially where you've got trees or hedgerows that they can hunt along they like to fly along these as a bit of a um, a hunting ground if you like but where you've got a lot of wildflowers you're going to attract a lot of insects and therefore provide a lot of food for the bats as well and quick little extra tip for you if you want to help bats even further get some bat boxes up south or east facing. I have done a video um, that I have previously done on the channel, which is all about how to make your own bat box. So do check that video out guys in the um, bird boxes section. I think it is, or um, boxes, I can't remember. Anyway, you'll find it on the channel. So have a look at that and have a go. But certainly bats will definitely benefit from not having a nice tidy mown lawn. So next we come on to our mammals, so all the things like wood mice, field voles, um, they're all going to be using these longer grassy areas which are going to be full of insects and invertebrates and caterpillars and everything else that are going to be hunting through all the, um, the longer grassy areas within your garden, uh, which in turn is going to provide food for the bigger mammals if you're lucky enough to have them things such as hedgehogs, I don't mean the hedgehogs are going to eat the mice, but the hedgehogs will certainly uh, devour any nice juicy grubs they find, any nice insects, worms, all that kind of thing. And then above them again, obviously we've got our urban foxes and badgers as well, as I say, if you are fortunate enough to have them. So they're going to be using all these longer grassy areas to hunt for the rodents, particularly the foxes. And on the way here to do this video, I just saw a rat come out of a bush and, and it grabbed something. I didn't quite see what it grabbed before it scuttled off back into the bush. So again, cover and longer grassy areas, perfect for them. But of course, a rat is a very nice prey item for a fox. So a really good way to help all the mammals all the way through the, uh, the food chain, if you like, from the small rodents to begin with, right the way up to the foxes and badgers. So a really, really good source of food for them. And on the topic of bigger mammals, um, it wouldn't be fair if I didn't touch on obviously our deer that we get here in the UK. So species such as roe deer, fallow deer, uh, red deer, if you're fortunate enough, if you've got a piece of land that's big enough, then obviously they're going to enjoy the longer grassy areas. It's great food for them, um, but even shorter grassy areas, to be fair, they will still find themselves wandering through. But yes, you can obviously provide 
habitat for deer as well by providing those longer grassy areas. Again, I know it's a bit of a controversial topic because many of you will no doubt say, well, flipping deer come into the garden and eat all my plants, so <laughs> I don't want to encourage them. But then, you know, that's, that's part of it. That's part of nature. So uh, yes, I thought I'd just mention that one while we're on the subject of mammals. Oh, and I should just say as a bit of a bonus point, which I meant to lump in with the, uh, the pollinating insects, obviously you're going to therefore no doubt provide larval food plants for your moths and butterflies as well. So not only the source of nectar and pollen for them, but things such as bird's foot trefoil for the common blue butterflies and many, many other insects as well. If you are having these plants flower, you're providing longer grassy areas. I mean, many of our butterflies we find here in the UK, at least seven species rely on grasses as an actual food plant. So things such as the large skipper, Essex skipper, um, small skipper, we've got uh, speckled wood, um, we've got brains gone dead, um, gatekeeper as well. Um, there are several species that will actually use grasses as a larval food plant. So of course, if we're mowing this all the time, you're probably mowing it either after the caterpillars have hatched from the egg or you're mowing the eggs off or you're not even providing the habitat for the butterflies to lay on in the first place. So yes, certainly many butterfly and moth species will benefit from longer grassy areas also. So as we've just spoken about some of the mammals that might be attracted to use these areas, so things such as uh, the field voles and the wood mice and animals like this, if you are fortunate enough to live on the edge of a town or you've got a few acres in which you're letting um, this grass grow, then you might be fortunate enough to attract animals such as barn owls, tawny owls, little owls, kestrels in the daytime as well, which will all use these longer grassy areas for hunting for the voles and mice in particular. It's a large part of their diet. Even buzzards as well will catch things like the grass snakes and the slow worms. Um, and obviously red kites as well will be hunting through if you're looking at looking it lucky enough as i say to have a, an acre or two then you may be uh, particularly lucky to get some of these species attracted to your area particularly if you're putting up boxes for them things like kestrels take quite well to boxes so do barn owls and tawny owls if they're put in the right position so yes you can certainly expect some of our larger animals to be attracted to these areas if you have the land for it so as we've just spoken about the more commonly associated animals with a pond, such as the frogs, the toads, the newts, I thought it quite fitting that we come on to the next group of animals, which are our odonata, so dragonflies and damselflies. Now you may think, well, they live in a pond, what are you talking about? Well, yes, they do as a larvae. However, when they emerge out of a pond, they will then, particularly the males, um, will go off to actually strengthen themselves up. They'll go off, they'll catch lots of insects. Obviously their main diet is insects. And what is going to be around a wildflower meadow and longer grassy areas? More insect diversity. So that's why in often the end of summer, sort of August, September, October even, if you've got longer meadow areas, you might find an absolute um, explosion in dragonfly and damselfly numbers because they are basically moving out to these areas to hunt, to build themselves up before they then move back to a wildlife pond to set up a territory so they can fight off all the other males that might be uh, bustling for a, or jostling around each other for territory. I've seen some wonderful sights in the past of particularly broad-bodied chasers, fabulous dragonfly we get here in the UK, literally crashing into each other, knocking other males out of the way for territory. So yes, dragonflies and damselflies will certainly be hunting for insects over your longer grassy areas. So I know we just looked at a moment ago all the birds that might be, or some of the birds that might be attracted to your longer grassy areas, things such as um, the starlings, the green woodpeckers as well, things like corvids, uh, so your carrion crows, jackdaws, rooks, all those sorts of birds, they're going to be foraging through for whatever they can find, but you can also attract some of the more agile flyers. So some of our visitors from Africa, 
birds such as my favorite bird like the house martin uh, in particular swallows as well no doubt many of you will have seen swallows just zipping across a field low in the summertime they're catching insects on the wing which is what they do along with swifts as well so all of these birds will be feeding on a lot of the insects that are lifting off particularly in the evening time that are lifting off these fields and even you may have seen it in the summer months as well when you see swarms and swarms and swarms of gulls uh, above your garden or above your town uh, when you might have a hatch of flying ants so flying ants will be attracted to these longer grassy areas and quite often they will just rise up and you'll get just absolute swarms of birds uh, above your head that's the wrong word but flocks of birds above your head um, where they are hunting for all the flying ants as well so yes certainly a lot of our birds our that are hunting across these areas will definitely benefit from the insects associated with them not only that birds such as our jays will be burying acorns and other nuts that they've no doubt found uh, around their woodland and they might have even planted a few within your garden uh, so if you do see the odd um, random oak tree popping up it's probably the likely product of a jay or a squirrel that's maybe planted them in your lawn or longer grassy areas and they've just forgotten about it throughout the winter time so this again is more habitat for them not directly but it may be a consequence of having these longer scrubby areas now i'm sure there are many species that i have missed out that you guys will correct me upon but i just wanted to highlight some of the main groups and let's be honest if we take a quick recap of what i've just spoken about I think we can all agree that it's pretty much every form of life almost that will rely and certainly benefit from having these longer grassy areas. I know they're not all relevant, I know some of you are not likely to get badgers or foxes or deer, um, but they're certainly species that can be attracted to gardens and will certainly benefit. So I really hope that this video has gone some way to highlighting just how much wildlife can benefit from a longer the area and as I say if we look now for a moment at how to manage these areas now what I would say is in terms of when to cut your meadow if you decide to have a no mow, mow, no mow summer um, you should actually be quite surprised as to how many wildflowers are there so you might be asking well how do I encourage these wildflowers how do I plant more and as I say I've already done a video that I'll put a link to at the end of this one to show you guys how to do that but also you may be very very surprised to find how many wildflowers are there existing in your lawn if you've been mowing it for years and you've never let it go then i'm sure you will already have daisies dandelions red clover bird's foot trefoil all sorts of species yarrow oxide daisy probably that are already there they've just never been given the chance to flower because they've been mown time after time after time so i'm sure you'll be very very pleased with the results so do let me know how you get on but in terms of the cutting and the maintenance what i would say is if you are worried about the neighbors mow a path through it mow a path around the edge that's maybe up to your herbaceous border around the edge of your garden and frame it actually make a showcase of it so that when your neighbors look from their upstairs window then they're going to look and think oh do you know what that's purposeful that was meant that's meant to look like that and it really does make a big difference and who knows hopefully the message will spread and we can help other people or encourage other people to try and do the same and i i really think we ought to be adopting this no mow summer concept as much as we can and as a last resort as i said at the beginning of this video if you have dogs and kids and you need somewhere for them to run around and your flowers are going to get trampled if you let it grow longer then don't panic just keep it mown on a higher setting just as high as the mower will cut mow it at that because a lot of these plants uh, i'll put a link in to a, a flowering nectar lawn video that i've just done on the channel uh, that i filmed in france a few days ago as well so you guys can have a look at that because you don't let, need to let it get really really high if you want if you don't want to you can still have loads and loads of flowers lots of color lots of pollen and nectar and lots of food plants for a lot of the wildlife that'll be in your area things such as i've just mentioned the red dead nettle the lesser celandine dandelions bird's foot trefoil red clover these are all plants that have adapted to flower at a very low height because of these guys which are now coming back this way <laughs> obviously the continued grazing of an area quite often in the summertime uh, if cows are in a particular field means that the plants will have to flower 
and spread seed uh, very quickly in order to reproduce because otherwise, <laughs> hello, <laughs> otherwise they're not going to get that chance to reproduce because they simply won't have time before they are nibbled off. Hello. <laughs> bit skittish but very inquisitive beautiful creatures what a fantastic way of managing a meadow don't you think yes so so there are ways in which you can manage them quite easily and all i would say is one cut in september time when everything's gone over when as much of the life has gone out of the meadow in terms of the flowers and the insects that are visiting those flowers but guys the main point in all of this if you are managing it is have a mosaic of habitats leave some areas uh, longer through the entire winter just leave them completely don't ever cut them because it's great overwintering habitat and foraging habitat as i said for the baby frogs that might be going through there or the young frogs um, as well as the mice and voles that might be in there in the autumn and winter time so yes have some long medium short cut some don't cut some the best wildlife habitat you can create is a mosaic so even if you don't want to let your entire garden go just ex experiment let me know how you get on anyway without any further ado i think i better head off before i uh, either myself or my bag becomes the next meal <laughs> and thank you so much for watching guys i really do appreciate you taking on board the no mo summer concept let me know how you get on, of course, as you go through the season. Uh, let me know what turns up. Let me know what surprised you. I've even found orchids that have cropped up in some lawns uh, because people haven't mown them. And it's really remarkable just what might be there. <laughs> Fantastic. They really, really are. Anyway, thank you so much for watching, guys. As always, I really do appreciate the support. And a big thumbs up to you all if you're still watching at this point. We've obviously just reached 50,000 subscribers. So huge, huge, huge thanks to you all for doing all that you are doing, for watching the videos, for sharing the videos, for helping wildlife. Together, we will definitely make a difference. So thank you so much, guys. I will see you all on the next video. Mm -hmm.